just a reminder that the education does align with the policy, the recognition and management of patients who are deteriorating. And our whole aim in the maternal safety and the fetal safety was about developing and reinforcing clinical and non-technical skills um, to improve our recognition and response to patients who are deteriorating. And in perinatal, that includes um, the maternal aspect and that fetal aspect. So we're thinking about those mothers and babies. And throughout the modules, um, we've made sure that we've embedded those very important human factors. So to start us this afternoon, we're going to actually start with a patient story and we're going to hear Mel's story now. The one thing I 100% knew for sure always was that I wanted to be a mother. We birthed Gigi and we definitely wanted a second child four years later. We decided we were ready. It was 30 hours of labor. We were just having a really hard time. Kalia was just not budging. And finally, they gave me something to induce labor. The most amazing part was them putting her on my chest right away. That was totally incredible. I spent one night at the hospital. We went home the next day. So I got home on a Friday and I started feeling really run down. Over the course of the weekend, I just kept feeling worse and worse. I started to feel like I had the flu incredibly exhausted, trouble breathing. I didn't have a fever, but I had terrible, terrible chills. We did decide to call the OBGYN's office. I was told very likely you're just dehydrated and you're overexerting yourself. You need to rest more, you need to drink more fluids. So we followed that advice. And then we kept calling because every day it was getting worse and worse. Symptoms included extreme shortness of breath, extreme fatigue, chills. My arms started hurting tremendously and started swelling. My breast milk stopped in the middle of the night and I had started vomiting. So after five days, we finally were able to get an appointment. And they checked my vitals several times because at one point my blood pressure was reading 88 over 40 unbelievably low. So my pulse was at 121. It's really scary. Again, I was told dehydration, overexertion, and I was prescribed bed rest and some painkillers. I went in for my exam on a Wednesday. Friday morning, I was blacking out and said, I feel like I'm dying. You feel so horrible. I mean, the worst you've ever felt in your entire life. At that point, we decided we need to call 911. If she had delayed going to the hospital by an hour, she would have died. If she had gone to a local hospital that wasn't equipped, she would have died. I was in the emergency room for several hours while they tried to get my blood pressure up. At one point, she just stopped breathing. They used the paddles to resuscitate her, to get her heartbeat going again. And then uh, that day, they took me up to the ICU. I barely remember it. And then that's it. I don't remember anything. I was in a coma for almost two weeks. The first time I heard the word sepsis ever in my life was when I came out of a coma. I was told that I had just survived sepsis and that I had gone into septic shock as a result of what they believed was a strep A infection that I contracted somehow during childbirth. I was at one point on four vasopressors and the vasopressors were used to keep my lungs, heart and brain functioning, which is why my limbs were black. My feet were black. Everything was bandaged and I had wounds all over my arms and legs. 
that I was extremely close to losing my right leg is really a miracle that I didn't die. I got really, really, really lucky. Okay, so this is um, where you can find it. So if you look in the maternal um, safety um, education pathway, this is where you'll see this module um, highly recommended. It is going to be mandatory for maternity clinicians, but recognising that everybody online today is not necessarily a maternity clinician, but I feel as though this, mod you know, this module would be really um, useful to people that work in ED departments, um, for example, or, you know, it could be that people in more rural sites um, as well. So please share this with your colleagues um, and let them know about it. But yes, thank you, Ryan. This is what you'll cover if when you do do the module. So within the module, um, we're looking at risk factors, the signs and symptoms of sepsis, and then really importantly, how we resuscitate and manage a deteriorating woman using the maternal sepsis pathway, and also how we refer and escalate to senior clinicians and being aware of your local SIRS and how you put that in play. So that's about um, the module who it's intended for and what you can hope to cover in there. All right, time for a bit of a pop quiz. I'm sure you came online to a webinar and particularly on a Friday, the last thing you were expecting was to be quizzed on this. Uh, but again, we thought we might just uh, have a bit of a pop quiz to start off uh, with and see how you go. So looking in your chat, um, there's no prizes for getting it right and there's no punishment for getting it wrong. You'll be glad to know. So the first one there, sepsis kills as many people as breast cancer, bowel cancer, HIV and AIDS, road traffic accidents, or all of the above combined. Put your votes in now and let's see whether we can get it. It is all of the above. Uh, sepsis is still one of the biggest killers that we have within New South Wales um, and unfortunately kills more people than breast cancer, bowel cancer, HIV and AIDS. Uh, and road traffic accidents combined. Um, it's one of those ones that's a bit of a an under-recognised and underfunded uh, piece of um, uh, work that needs, needs more focus on, hence why we're doing this module. Next question for you, next poll, next quiz coming <laughs> at you. Is there a prize, Ryan? No prizes, no um, punishments. It is completely... Uh, anonymized and just for, for us to get a bit of a, a feel for things. So which of the following signs and or symptoms may indicate maternal sepsis? Ryan, can they answer more than one? There could be more than one in this one. Yes, thank you, Mary, for that uh, tick. Good, get your pathways out. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, interestingly enough, every single one of those is uh, a sign or symptom to indicate maternal sepsis. And as Mary quite rightly indicated, um, the good idea would be to get your uh, maternal sepsis pathways out because at the very top of your maternal sepsis pathway is a uh, list of all of the signs, symptoms and risk factors. So the patients that are at high risk of sepsis. And there is quite an extensive list of these are the just uh, five that I've chosen randomly um, to allow us to indicate um, or to give us a bit of a feel. It's got somebody saying they're having difficulty using the poll app. They can pop in the chat if you like. Um, yeah, if, you, if you're unable to use it. Sorry, I understand that not everyone has the, <clears throat> the um, Teams app. And if you don't, you might have a little bit of limited functionality with that. So apologies if people are missing out on some of this functionality. But uh, uh, like I said, essentially, there's no prize. So even if you're unable to answer it, don't worry, you're not missing out. Uh, next quiz for you. What are the key actions to treat and manage a patient with sepsis? Again, could be multiple options within this one to answer. Give oxygen if needed, take blood cultures, collect a lactate and other bloods, uh, give an IV fluid bolus and give IV antibiotics. There we go. Look at those people joining <laughs> in, even if they can't even use the uh, 
Um, it's the poll. And correct, we're going with all of the above. Yeah, they're the six key actions that is talked about within the sepsis pathway. Again, what we'd encourage you to do is refer to that pathway. It really will step you through all of those key actions and make sure that nothing gets missed uh, along the way. Um, next one for you. And this is the last one. Sepsis is one of the major causes of maternal mortality among all women. True or false? Don't want to give it away, but there's a lot of yeses in the chat. <laughs> there is a lot of true, true, <laughs> trues in the chat, and you are correct. Um, it's unfortunately um, a leading cause of maternal mortality uh, amongst all women, um, and uh, even more so amongst our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women as well. So an unfortunate statistic, but again, why we're really keen to ensure that sepsis remains at the forefront of everyone's minds and why we're so keen and so excited that this module is, is part of uh, perinatal safety education. All right. Last one I've got for you as a random question, uh, so not a random, as an anonymous question. Is your maternity unit using the maternal sepsis pathway? And we've got an option there for yes, no, or not sure. And again, if you're unable to use the quiz, uh, if you can just pop it in the chat, it'd be great for us to understand um, how many people actually have the sepsis pathway as part of their usual processes, know where it's found, and are able to utilize it for the care of their women that may be at risk of sepsis. Fantastic. Looks like we've got quite a lot uh, of people that are aware of the sepsis pathway and know where it is and are using it in their current unit with one unsure. So thank you for your honesty with that one. Great, I'll hand over to Mary. So Mary, before you start, somebody's just popped in the chat that midwives use it medical ad hoc. Yeah, Claudia, do you, do you mind uh, expanding on that a little bit? Sorry, I'm using a mask because I'm sharing an office, so I might be a bit muffled. That's okay. Thank you. You're good. Um, the thing is that the pathway is there, and we all use it when we have a sepsis lady, but the medical professionals don't actually follow the guidelines in the pathway. Um, and I'd, I'd say it's a, a bit of um, either they don't know it's there or uh, they choose to ignore and, and do other treatment guidelines. So it's a little bit mixed. Um, when you show them the pathway, they go, oh, okay, but they don't necessarily follow it through to how it's meant to, you know, when you start the treatment, you follow up and so forth with the pathway. So that's the, um, that, those are the issues that we're having in this area of health. Thanks very much. Appreciate the feedback. And I guess that's one of the positives of, of the, the module now being part of a mandatory training program as part of the perinatal safety education is that all staff um, will be required to do it and therefore will be aware of the pathway, the benefits of the pathway, and hopefully we should see some adherence to it. But we'll talk a little bit more a little bit later down the track around the sepsis toolkit and how we might be able to focus on some of those quality improvement, uh, particularly around compliance of using the pathway. Thanks, Ryan. I'll I'll take over. It actually sounds with 93% of our, our listeners, uh, participants already using the pathway, you probably don't need these extra couple of slides, but I've really got them there as a bit of background. Um, and you, you likely know most of this, but the Sepsis Kills program started back in 2011 as a response to a statewide failure to recognise and recognise sepsis and then treat it as a medical emergency. Um, you know, we know it's a leading cause of death in hospitals, and it's one of the most frequent causes of a rapid response call. We've done some auditing around the state, and it's around about 30% of rapid response calls in adults are sepsis related. So it's something to really consider when your patient deteriorates, particularly if they're needing a rapid response, is could this be sepsis? 
And we, we often find that sepsis just hasn't been considered in those very early stages. And it is a difficult diagnosis. I mean, it's as it, it tells you a lot in the module about um, mask, the sepsis is often masked in the woman who is pregnant um, due to the physiolog natural physiological changes. So it's quite hard to detect whether they're septic or whether this, it's just normal or there's something else going on. And because of that, we really advocate in the pathway and in the module that you involve a senior clinician as soon as possible. And obviously you need that senior clinician to be on board with using the pathway. And again, we'll, we'll pick that up a bit later. Um, but it's important for, for a senior clinician who probably has seen sepsis many times to be able to say, yes, this is sepsis and this is the management plan. And particularly around, do we need to escalate this woman to ICU or perhaps retrieval to another facility? Next slide, please. And so this pathway obviously is, is really um, well known by you. And then I think probably the important thing to bear in mind is some of the feedback that we get is that, oh, well, anybody could meet sepsis pathway criteria, whether they're a child or an adult. But the important starting point is that the person has a known or suspected infection. Um, yep, I mean, you can have tachycardia, you can have blood, low blood pressure for a range of things. But with that starting point of having an infection plus the abnormal vital signs, be they in the yellow zone where it may be an earlier sepsis or in the red zone where they're likely to be going into septic shock, um, then that, that's your sort of in, initial picture to say, let's consider this as sepsis until we can exclude it. And then, then we can either have a management plan for sepsis or we start looking to see why else is this woman deteriorating because clearly something's going on. Okay, next slide, please, Ryan. The second part of, the, of moving on from the recognition is the management. And as we've already had that question around the six key actions, and I think people got that quite nicely. I mean, obviously oxygen is used when needed. If the woman is shocked, then that will definitely be an item. Two sets of blood cultures is the gold standard. We're actually just about to put out a new blood culture guideline. We've uh, revised the one that's currently out there. The information is the same, but it will be presented in a, a little, bit, little better. But two sets is still better than one set. And that's because the second set will give you more reliability in, in picking up what the, the, um, the culture that's needed. Serum lactate, I appreciate in pregnancy that lactate levels, particularly with a, a, a woman who is in labour, that those lactate levels will be elevated anyway. But la increased lactate in association with an infection is de it definitely has, ha has a relationship. And um, outside of pregnancy, a lactate of two or more is of concern and four for any patient is a rapid response on, on our, it's a, an additional criteria on um, the smock. But understanding that, that lactate levels will increase in, in labour, what is more important is the trend. And if, if you think there's infection, then take, take, really take note of those lactates. Don't ignore it just because you think it could, could be up naturally anyway. And then the interventions around the intravenous fluids and antibiotics um, and then the monitoring. And, and importantly, you know, to see whether that first hour or two of treatment is making a difference. Does she, is she responding to the fluids? If she's had a, you know, a, a reasonable amount of fluid, then moving to vasopressors, and obviously that's an ICU call, or is it transferring the woman out to a higher level facility? Next slide, please, Ryan. So that, that's sort of it, the, the nuts and bolts of the pathway, but has it made a difference? We, we introduced it in, in the maternal pathway in 2015, but we actually started the program back in 2011. And you can see from this chart that it shows you the median time to administration of first antibiotics. And we measure that time frame from in, in the emergency department from um, triage, or if it's in the wards or you know, labour ward or wherever, from the time the sepsis is recognised. And we're aiming to get treatment for a patient with septic shock within 60 minutes. And so you can see initially in our programme, we did some retrospective data, the time to antibiotics was sort of sitting up there towards the three hour mark. It's come down. Bearing in mind a median is just the middle number in a whole range of numbers. And I can tell you that 150, 60 minutes at the beginning, the range was 16 minutes up to 12 hours plus. 
Um, and for every hour of delay, there's an increase in mortality. And so, you know, those people were, were the ones that often had died. Um, we can see a really good improvement over the years, and it's now down sort of sitting 60 to 70 minutes. But again, I emphasize that is a median, and it's really, really good if you, if you measure every patient. That's another story, and Sarah will talk about that later. Next slide, thanks, Ryan. And finally, this slide just shows we, you know, if we get a process improvement by having so time to antibiotics, you can also measure time to fluids, whether patients have lactates or blood cultures and, and monitoring. But overall, we can look at whether there's a decrease in sepsis related mortality. And we've done really well in this state. Um, international literature will tell you that for septic shock, that the um, mortality is anywhere from 20 to 45 percent. This chart captures all sepsis, so it's not about just about septic shock. But over the years from 2009-11, we've decreased our mortality from 18% down to around about 12.5%. So that's a fantastic achievement across the state. Bear in mind, this isn't just maternal patients. It is all patients, but the maternity patients are within that. Um, we don't have enough of data um, for us to, to, to do this, this graph, but we will be because we're hoping everybody's going to be using more, more um, pathways and more data. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, I'm moving back to you, Ryan. So I guess the question we had was, uh, how do you know that sepsis is well managed in your maternity unit or ward? And we're going to throw it open. This is obviously a facilitated discussion, so it's enough of us talking and we want to hear from you. Hi, it's Kate Piggott here. Um, we actually run an audit and we've done since we've um and we have done since we implemented it. So that's one way that we know. Great, we've got Catherine there. Catherine, IMS and incidents, how do you monitor or track them specifically? No, Catherine might not be able to communicate on the microphone. Anyone else? Does anyone know what their rate of maternal sepsis is within their department? Can you hear me? Sorry, it's Kate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, sorry. Um, <coughs> that's my phone. Sorry. Uh, I know for last year. Um, uh, maternal sepsis using the septic, septic pathway, uh, whether or not uh, that's that's the only um, uh, parameter that I can have, whether or not, do you know whether they went on to have it? Um, we used it in 5% of our women. About 5%. Okay, yeah. that's good. Good. So you've got got an indication or an awareness of, of uh, yes. prevalence, which is, which is a great. Yeah, yeah. So Kate, Kate, do you measure the with those ones that you go on the pathway? Do you have any any knowledge around how long it takes them to get their antibiotics? We're just trying to do that now because I've been trying to do it through Explorer, you know, the discern analytics. But I believe that there's going to be a, a maternity uh, program now that can grab that data because otherwise we've had to go through it by hand, which yeah. is very laborious. <laughs> Absolutely, and and that's been one of the downsides. Um, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, I'm amazed because I've got something like fifty thousand patients entered into the sepsis database since two thousand eleven, which is an enormous amount of work. But we do recognise that data collection is onerous. Yeah. Um, but obviously, the value is that it, it gives you some information back. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, we completely yeah. understand how difficult that is. So, so yes, well, that well done for looking at it. <laughs> and I see Narelle's put up uh, that it, you can do it in quas as well. So that's something we have to look at. Yeah, yeah Narelle, did you want to around... share? Yeah. Sorry, Narelle, did you want to share your quas audit? What sort of questions are you exploring there? What sort of data are you collecting from your quas audit?
I'm just having a look at Narelle's on mute. <laughs> I think everyone's on mute to start with yeah. as a default. But There's a num there are a number hear. of places around the state that use quads for the sepsis and deteriorating patient audits, which is which is a great way to do it. Um, and and yeah, you know, we we're keen to know about anybody that's doing that. That would be really helpful. In Southwest Sydney, we were developing a project team for one of our facilities, but again, it's kind of similar to Kate. We've, there's no real structure in or easy way to collect the data. It is going through manually and collecting paper documents and reviewing cases on IMS, um, because although we can identify the women that have commenced on a pathway, we also then have to find the women that should have commenced on a pathway and may not have. So that's yeah. sort of a challenge yeah. for us out here as well. Yeah. Ryan and Mary, I'm wondering, you know, even for um, some of our colleagues online that might not necessarily know how well managed it is, but I'm just wondering what the gut feeling is out there, if people, you know, generally feel it's as well managed as it could be. And, you know, even if you can't, you know, if you put in the chat, if you think it is, it would be just good to know what your feelings are around that as well, or whether you think there is room for improvement. Look, in Southwest Sydney, from the clinicians I've spoken to, we tend, in the maternity space, we tend to do the right things. We we start fluids, we give antibiotics, we don't always collect lactates. That's an area that we often forget. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sometimes a hit and a miss with starting the actual pathway. So the, although we do the right thing, we don't yeah. start the pathway. And then again, through the ED, that, that's an area that we're looking at improving. Yeah, and, and you know, and I think that's a really valid thing that the pathway, it's the piece of paper itself doesn't have to be used. It's a really useful tool for everybody to be doing the same thing. But if everybody's doing that, then that's great. Um, and and you know, probably the next thing for you to be thinking about is can, can we actually measure some of that, even just, just a very small sample of patients to both women to be able to say, yes, we're doing it well, or perhaps there is room for improvement. It may be that you're getting the antibiotics in, but your fluids are not great or your blood culture is not great, rather than, than just thinking, oh, we think it's okay. And if and if you do get a good result, then it, it's fantastic validation and, and able to tell everybody that. And if it's not such a good result, it gives you something to work on. I think one of the things is that often the medical officers, because they're doing what they think needs to be done, it's difficult to encourage them to put them on the sepsis pathway. I've, one of the yeah. responses I've had is, I'm already doing all of that, so I don't need to use the sepsis pathway. We'll wait until we get results to decide whether they're septic or not. Like, And that's not a criticism of them. It's just that they feel like they're already doing all of the things that they need to be doing, I guess, reinforcing what Katie said. Yeah. Um, yeah. Claudia here. Yeah. I tend to agree with the, the ladies before me. That's what I was um, alluding to, the fact that midwives will use it. The medical officers may or may not use it. They use it at hot. Yes. They have their own treatment plans. And yes, lactate is a major one that they don't follow up with consistently. Um, they may not even do um, blood um, cultures consistently either. So it's like they do the first line of treatment, which is... Um, give IV fluids, maybe take one set of um, cultures and start them on the, on, on the antibiotics, may or may not do a lactate, um, but they don't, it's not uh, structured um, mm. the way we would like it to be. And that's why, that's why I said what I said earlier on. It, yeah. um, there is that inconsistency, regardless of whether we're going to do education around that or not because it's something that we don't um, mandate and it's because something that's suggested, I think um, and that is the issue. And data collection around um, the sepsis pathway has been entirely difficult since 2015. I remember working at, at um, my area health down the south coast and um, I know there was one advocate for that. Um, she was the SIR CNC and she was consistently collecting that data and it's arduous, it's difficult. And it is, um, and if it's too difficult, people just won't do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's Kate here. Um, I agree with that. Um, I just wondered, is there any plan to have it online at all, Mary? Yes. Because then you can trace it and it might yeah. give a bit of push. 
So we're, we're in the process of finalising an adult sepsis pathway in the EMR. It's it's based on a, an existing CERNA tool that we've um, adapted based, based on a big evaluation. Um, and it essentially picks up on vital signs and um, some pathology values. It then requires a clinician at the bedside to say, is this sepsis? But then you can work in a power, a power plan that will, so you document, you know, it tells you what antibiotics to give, what fluids to give, you know, reminds us about lactates and blood cultures, and you capture that in the electronic fields. Um, and then you, you sort of move into your 48-hour management plan. And the, the ideal thing from that is that we can then collect data from that. It, it's still in the sort of final tweaking stages. We've just done a pilot at Prince of Wales, um, and then, and then, then we'll st and we're starting to look at other cohorts. So there's there's an equivalent paediatric piece going on in the children's network, and then we'll need to look at maternal. We 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 deliberately excluded maternal um, clients from this using the adult one because your parameters are slightly different with those physiological changes and we we thought there was a risk to doing that and so we we need to do something separate for you i just going back to what katie said about ed the problem we we went online after ed so they they hated the maternal chart because it was a piece of paper and they were so you know all online um yeah. and then you know so but anyway i think we've worked through that it just took a long time yeah but it would be eventually it would be good <laughs> Yeah, and I and I think it's it's important for us to acknowledge we we're very mindful that we're asking you to use a piece of paper when most of your world now is electronic, and and that that has its challenges, um, mm -hmm. but it is there as a guide, uh, and I think from a senior clinician perspective who perhaps doesn't want to follow the guide, it's there to to, to it's really aimed at the more junior clinicians. The seniors know it well. But we want them to guide the juniors so that they'll they'll learn from it and consistently do it do, do the care in the same way. So whether you're you're out at Bathurst or up in far far northwest uh, north northern New South Wales or southern, you're going to get the same care as you would in a metropolitan site, and that's yeah. really important. And I think that's it, isn't it? It's about ensuring that we have the same treatment for every woman every time, regardless of where they present. And that's yeah. the beauty of the pathway is it does provide that consistency and that structure so that nothing's missed. Um, it's Claudia again. Um, the, the concerns that I have um, for, our, for our area health, particularly in ED and ICU and those areas, they don't necessarily use the same um, system like EMR or... Um, Yep. They use Eric or they use other systems in yeah. particular in um, theatres as well. So that makes it really difficult. Um, you know, if you get a woman presenting to ED that doesn't necessarily um, sort of transfer across properly to EMR um, and then you miss that opportunity. So there's those issues associated with that as well. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Claudia. I think that sort of takes us on to our next point, which is really around what are some of the barriers or challenges that you're facing um, in relation to recognising and, and managing maternal sepsis. So I, I recognise that paper in a digital world, um, various digital platforms, ERIC, FirstNet, Surgeonet, um, all, uh, you know, different, uh, definitely major challenges. Uh, what are some of the other barriers or, or challenges that others are facing? Hi, it's Jane Griffith. Currently it's COVID. Um, and the fact that um, for a while there last year, first first thought with any sort of fever or symptoms was about COVID instead of thinking about our normal or abnormal maternal conditions. Yeah. So I think with um, as clusters flare and die down again, I think that's going to continue to be an issue um, of heightened anxiety, but but also heightened risk of missing missing that something else is going on. Yeah. Absolutely, and we've we've seen that at a, at a state level uh, with uh, incidents of of uh, patients that had mis misdiagnosis or, or mistreatment as a result result of uh, COVID blindness. Yeah, and I think the important point to add there then is is that COVID can result in sepsis. So a patient who dies from COVID generally has become septic, and so you know if yeah. you have got a COVID patient woman. In, in your environment, I don't mean patient woman, I mean patient or woman, it, depending on where you're, where you're working, um, 
then you know you need to con don't don't stop thinking about the fact they have an infection that could result in sepsis and then they will need that that other intervention i mean because it's covid the the interventions are slightly tweaked but the principles are exactly the same thanks ryan all right and the last question we've got for you is are there opportunities to improve the recognition and management of sepsis maternal sepsis in your ward or area There's always opportunities um, to improve and educate staff on it, but I think at the moment with current levels of high acuity and increased levels of um, morbidity when it comes to the patient load, um, it just becomes a sort of an issue that we have to address from a from a perspective of downtime um, education. That's our biggest. Um, that's our biggest problem is that we're dealing with um, sort of busy units with minimal staff who are already stretched to the limit. So I guess uh, one of the reasons you invented this module, um, Maria, was to um, find another way of giving that information to staff. But again, it's a challenge getting them off the floor long enough to do that. Mm -hmm. education so maybe it's a case of things like this the webinar you're talking about or taking it to them um, having it available on the desktop that they could use if they ever get time to do it on the shift things like that is that what you mean finding different ways to get the information mm -hmm. yeah I guess that's that's definitely an area for you know if the education is is the area of, uh, of, of room for improvement or what's lacking then absolutely those thinking of some of those creative things uh, but it was also thinking about are there other opportunities to improve um, the recognition of sepsis, but also the general management. So um, in how we uh, treat the patients as well. And I, I suppose um, I'll chime in here. It's it's um, sometimes our systems and processes that we have in place in our, you know, in our wards and our units are not set up for success. And sometimes that can be the biggest hindrance as to why things aren't going quite according to plan. So it is looking, um, education isn't the solution for everything. I, I appreciate how important it is for people to have the right knowledge and skills to look at, you know, be it sepsis or other, um, you know, other areas of concern or clinical areas. But we do also need to make sure that we have, take a bigger, bigger look at the picture and, and what else is going on. So I may as well continue because mm -hmm. I'm yep. supposed to be the, the the bright ending in terms of the positive, what are we going to do about it and how can we improve <laughs> um, maternal <laughs> sepsis? <laughs> and look, I totally, I totally hear what you're saying in terms of capacity and, um, you know, working to the limits. But I suppose hopefully after kind of hearing some of the things that I talk about, it might just um, make you look at things in potentially a different way and, and and be able to kind of identify small things that can be done to try and help improve um, care. So I am going to introduce to you um, the concept of the Clinical Excellence Commission. We have developed a number of quality improvement toolkits. I will go through what a toolkit is. Um, this introduction is by our Chief Executive, Carrie Maher, and it's quite general about our toolkits. But um, what is exciting, we do have a sepsis toolkit, but there will also be some maternity specific toolkits that we are currently um, in development. So it will kind of roll nicely for how we will help to support you do improvement work moving forward. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to tell you a little bit about our quality improvement toolkits that the Clinical Excellence Commission is launching today. These toolkits are for you as clinicians or clinical teams if you've got a great idea for patient safety improvement or you're looking for support and advice to help you with your improvement work. They're a great starting point for teams or individuals who want to get started on improvement and safety work and they allow you to look at your data, to think about your priorities and your risks around safety and to use everyday tools to focus you on what changes will make the biggest impact and how you measure that impact in relation to safety outcomes. The toolkits that we're launching today include areas like sepsis, 
medication safety, VTE and comprehensive care for older people and end of life. And our intent is to continue with these toolkits in the coming months and look at other areas like um, catheter acquired urinary tract infection and other topics that you want us to develop toolkits within. So we'd invite you to talk to your colleagues about the toolkits, form a team for improvement, get your ideas up on our quids system so that you can share your learning and talk to other teams across New South Wales Health about the things that are making a difference and are proving to be most successful. We invite you to join our quality improvement community and share your learning and your best outcomes for patient care. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, as, as um, Carrie mentioned, so we have um, been developing over the last kind of, you know, 12 months or so, this concept of a toolkit. And so effectively, the toolkits are um, pulling together a suite of resources that will help um, clinicians and um, teams run quality improvement projects. So the resources are founded on the principles of quality improvement. So they very much align with um, how we've always done business around quality improvement. So using that improvement science um, methodology approach, if any of you are familiar with that. But it's supposed to be, these toolkits are a really practical guide as to how to run a quality improvement project. We have very much written it if, um, in the sense that if you've never done quality improvement before, this is absolutely perfect. It's it's a beginner's guide and it does take you through a really nice step-by-step -step approach as to how to kind of approach a quality improvement project and work through each of the different phases. So as Carrie mentioned, we have um, specifically developed one for sepsis and that is for sepsis, be it in maternity, paediatrics, adults, etc. You can apply those principles specifically to maternity. Um, another one of interest is um, potentially VTE as well. And um, as I said before, we are we are working on some very specific maternity related toolkits, which um, we'll hopefully be able to release in the coming months. But the the general look of the toolkits, how they're structured, they're all the same. So you're not going to be getting different information if you're flicking between various toolkits. It'll just be tailored to that um, specific clinical area. So um, there are six components to our sepsis toolkit. The first one is about getting started. And if any of you have done a quality improvement project before, or any project, it's really important to get these foundations correct. And a big part of that is making sure you have support from to A, get the time to these projects, but B, also um, enable you to have access to any resources and um, just general support to run your project. We have provided some really useful resources in there about how to kind of go about gaining that executive support as well. Um, so we've, we've tried to do as much of the work as we can to help you get that off the ground. A big part um, of that getting started phase is making sure that you understand your data. And so we have pulled together a really nice Excel document that goes through some kind of key data points to collect around sepsis care. Um, these can be adapted to maternity, but I suppose the, the thing that I've heard from just listening to you today, it is very, can be very time intensive and arduous collecting data. And what I would strongly encourage you to do is um, taking a small sample of women and looking at their medical records. You don't have to audit everyone or everyone who's possibly come through your maternity unit with sepsis, but starting with a small sample. And that is something your local quality improvement advisors can help you with. But also if you contact um, us as well, we can help with providing some guidance around how much data to look at collecting. But that that, da that data is essential because it really helps to kind of put forward your case as to why you want to do some improvement work in this area. The second part is all about making those improvements. So we, we take you through the steps of how to actually go about identifying what are the causes of the problem? So I'm, you know, hearing about you talk about, you know, lactate's not always consistently taken or there's not always blood cultures taken. It's not only the human element that's involved in that, but also what are the processes that are around, um, you know, making sure that you've got the correct um, pathology bottles on hand or have you got the right testing, um, like the lab slips, et cetera. So looking at the process more broadly than just purely the human element. So we 
we go through all of that in the toolkit about how to go about diagnosing the problem and then also then coming up with possible solutions that you will then test to see actually do they do they improve what we're after or do they do nothing and we can kind of move on and, and try something else. A big part as I've already mentioned is, is data so not only is that data at the beginning really essential but we want to make sure that we collect data along that improvement project to prove if um, the changes that we're making are actually giving us the desired result or not. Um, it kind of goes hand in hand with the education. There's no point doing a quality improvement project if nobody knows about it. So we've provided some um, strategies about how you can kind of communicate that that um, your project or your improvement work more broadly, not just within your own unit, um, as well as the education. So obviously the um, sepsis module for maternity will be a really key part of that education, but also looking at what other kind of local activities that you can do as well. And then the final part is actually once you've achieved the changes you want, how can you spread that and sustain that? So there's no point doing something if it's going to fall over in the next month once you stop you know, giving all your effort to it. How do we kind of build that um, change into the system long term? So I'm just going to quickly stop the presentation for a sec and I am really um, wanted to kind of show you what it looks like because it's really hard to wrap your head around the toolkits if, if um, just based upon those headings. So you can see on our um, on our homepage, right underneath the Maternal Safety Education Week tile, we have a link straight to our toolkit. And you can see here we've got the sepsis toolkit. So this will be where you'll find all of our to toolkits futuristically. And um, we've built them as a series of web, web pages. So it means that you can always come to this. You'll always have the most up-to-date information rather than downloading a PDF and saving a copy on a, you know, in five different USBs. But you just work your way through the various pages and you'll get the information that you need relevant to your um, where you're up to with your project, as well as um, you'll have access to a number of different resources as well. So this is this particular one here, the baseline data collection tool is that Excel document I refer to. So we we have really tried, I think um, we've, we've achieved a really great result with how you can kind of go about um, starting this improvement work and basically working your way through. So I would really encourage you to check them out. Um, it can be, I'm not gonna go through it all because it'd be way too overwhelming, but just take some time to have a look through and see um, possibly if there are things that you can start to apply to improve sepsis care for women in your unit at the moment. Sorry, I'm just gonna quickly go ahead. I'm just going to jump ahead one slide and I'll come back to this. Um, Carrie mentioned during her video that um, it, about the importance of quids or how quids kind of fill, um, feeds into the toolkits. If you're not familiar with quids, um, quids is a platform that was built by the CEC and it's, it's a really effective platform to kind of monitor and track your improvement projects. What we have done is um, we've set up a um, improvement project specific to sepsis and teams have the opportunity to join that team. So in a sense, creating that community of practice five. So you can you yourselves can track your quality improvement projects, but also then be linked in with other, other teams who are doing sepsis work. So you can kind of have that conversation around barriers or challenges that you're having, sharing resources and so forth. So um, it is something that you can um, register to join and you can find it via that toolkits webpage. But if you again, if you have any questions or you're not overly familiar with quids, please feel free to, to reach out to us. Um, and I'll pass back to Maria or Ryan. I guess this is just really about where we wanted to leave you guys with some sort of take home key messages. And I guess uh, the first and foremost being that, you know, sepsis, sepsis really is a medical emergency, uh, as I'm sure you all agree and, and needs to be treated and, and um, uh, addressed as such. So it, that early recognition and that early treatment, including that full bundle approach is really what the literature and what the evidence does point to saving lives. 
I guess the next one really is around thinking, could this potentially be sepsis? As Mary indicated earlier on in the presentation, around 30% of all uh, rapid response calls the, from the data that we found uh, does uh, relate to sepsis. And so it's a matter of recognising that in that re rapid response call or clinical review and that deterioration, thinking, could this potentially be sepsis? And always keep that at the, uh, the forefront of your mind. Also recognising that there are some phys physiological changes during pregnancy and that these do tend to mask uh, and also make it challenging to recognise sepsis, which is why we highly encourage people to use the pathway and always have that in the front of their mind that could this potentially be sepsis. And uh, also recognising that it could be both mother or baby uh, that could have sepsis and, and needs to be screened and treated for sepsis. So. I'll pass it back to Maria if she's got any final comments before Thanks. we sign you off for the evening afternoon. Thanks, Ryan. Um, I guess it, it just came to my mind that um, physiological changes are also, they're included in the systematic assessment module. So again, you may wish to point that out to any of your colleagues who, you know, are maybe not targeted to do this education, um, but that that's in there as well. Um, but no, um, I think we could probably um, end the PowerPoint and just open up and see if anybody has any questions before we end our afternoon session. I can't see any questions in the chat, but um, there are some thanks in there. So I would just like to take the opportunity to thank you all for taking part um, in the webinar today. Um, it's so great um, to have connection with you all. Um, as I said, it's, you know, it's making these modules and doing these webinars and for our learning, it's only possible without with your participation. Um, we need to hear from you. Um, I would like to thank my colleagues, um, Zeb and Joe online for supporting us with the webinar and then Ryan, Mary and Sarah for facilitating an excellent um, session today for us. I hope that it's been helpful. Um, please check out the toolkits. Um, you can also, if you have found yourself on the maternity and neonatal page on the sepsis tile, that will take you as well to the toolkit. Um, but, you know, just get in contact with us, CEC-maternity. And if we need to put you in touch with different colleagues, we will do. Um, but we'd love to hear from you.